afternoon, everyone, and this is a joint uh, committee meeting between our Education and Culture Committee and our Health and Human Services Committee. Uh, I'll be turning it over to President Albernos for uh, some remarks as chair of the Health and Human Services Committee uh, momentarily, uh, but did first want to welcome our guests. Uh, we have Dr. Raymond Kroll, our uh, director of our Department of Health and Human Services with us today, uh, Ms. Joanne Barnes, who uh, it used to serve in the role where Ms. Treadvance now is, as our uh, leader of children, youth, and family services. Uh, but she is now a contractor with DHHS and knows uh, a lot about the history of this. And so uh, we're really blessed to be able to have her as a part of the discussion today as she was an instrumental part in helping us uh, as we came to some of these decision points. Um, uh, Dr. Barbara Andrews, who's uh, the Administrator for Early Childhood Services with our Department of Health and Human Services, We've got Sharon Friedman, the director of Montgomery Moving Forward. And then, of course, we have a number of the partners with our Montgomery Moving Forward uh, entity that are with us today, including Kathy Stevens, as well as Kevin Beverly uh, and so uh, and Susan Madden. And so um, I know that we'll have them as a part uh, uh, to be able to give us some of their thoughts as well. Although I know Sharon is their able leader. Uh, it's going to be <laughs> kind of uh, laying out some of the uh, details uh, from MMF's uh, perspective. But I really just wanted to start off with kind of level setting where we are. Um, as this uh, ECE entity was introduced back uh, towards the end of last year, back in November, um, and we had a public hearing that I think was at the end of uh, November uh, that uh, gave folks an opportunity to kind of weigh in. Um, and I really want to give a shout out uh, to my good friend, and I know she gets this a lot, but um, to Councilmember Navarro uh, for all of her great work uh, since the very beginning. And now as we're transitioning off, people don't understand, um, uh, you know, what uh, has, has been laid in terms of groundwork to make these things happen. Councilmember Navarro, before she even came into elected office, has always been focused on early care and education. Uh, so much so that she started in a nonprofit entity here in Montgomery County, specifically designed around ensuring that we meet that need. And that need has continued to grow. Uh, this is nothing new uh, in terms of what it is that we're focused on. Parents have always sought out to have a place where they can ensure that their children uh, have a safe uh, place that's high quality, uh, where they can learn and be ready to enter into our public school system or private school system uh, and be able to thrive. And the reality is, is that it's that simple in terms of what it is that we're trying to achieve, but it's actually very complicated. Uh, and it's one that involves both our private sector as well as public sector, uh, because parents cut across all levels, uh, but it also involves economic development. And it is something that when we look at our private sector businesses, they know just how important it is. Uh, many parents who may be watching today uh, do understand and appreciate the fact that their businesses actually have early care education opportunities for their children. It might have been one of the reasons why they decided to work for uh, that particular company. I know that when I worked for Marriott, it was very attractive that uh, Marriott had at corporate headquarters uh, an early care and education facility that was there. Uh, so from that standpoint, it really is uh, something that is a no brainer in terms of that we need to make sure that we're pushing. Uh, and so ensuring that we have an entity that is focused on trying to maximize the opportunities that we have uh, in both the private and public sectors makes complete sense. And it is something that was highlighted in the Kerwin Commission's uh, recommendations as well. I actually led that work group, so uh, I have a, a great deal of experience. I have the battle scars as well um, from working with all of the partners, uh, but certainly one in which I think that we highlighted at the end of the day what is important, and that is that uh, we continue to focus on growing as many opportunities as possible uh, for parents and families throughout uh, Montgomery County and, quite honestly, throughout the state. And so from that standpoint, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Councilmember Albernos for uh, some remarks before I get into uh, the level setting of what we're looking and intending to accomplish today. Uh, and how we're going to proceed for today's meeting and then uh, potential follow-up meetings. So, uh, Council President. Uh, thank you, Chairman Rice. You said it extraordinarily well. I love it uh, when we have joint education and culture and HHS committee sessions because we've tackled some 
really complex issues and done a lot of heavy lifting, especially these last two years. And this is another really good example of moving forward. So, and pun intended there. Um, I just want to acknowledge um, the really great work done by our community uh, and all of the key stakeholders. The level, level of organization around this issue is among the most impressive I've seen in 16 years in working in county government. Um, and I also want to say that we already have such a strong infrastructure led by the Department of Health and Human Services, Dr. Andrews, Joanne Barnes, uh, who's left quite a legacy uh, that I know uh, Ms. Treadvance is going to keep going. And welcome, Ms. Treadvance. Uh, we're, we're very excited to be working with you in your new capacity on behalf of the administration. And I do also want to uh, uh, acknowledge the great work of my good friend, Bibi Ortero. Uh, who has been a tremendous asset, especially these last few years. And, you know, the, this has always been important work, never more important than right now. Uh, and I do want to publicly acknowledge the sacrifices of our early childhood and education workforce that are continuing to report to work, continuing to provide just really outstanding services on behalf of our children, youth, and families. And what we're discussing today in many ways is a way to honor their work. Um, by elevating it in a way that will help us put in a, in a better position to advocate and a better position to be able to leverage philanthropic and private resources in a way that government alone can't advocate on a policy-wide level, especially across the state, uh, to be able to ensure that we have a more cohesive system and that is working collaboratively and all rowing in the same direction. And in that vein, uh, this incredible entity uh, is really going to be groundbreaking and I think follows a long tradition of public-private partnerships that have worked very well over many years here in our community. And I do want to end with an acknowledgement that you mentioned yourself, and we will never be able to say this enough, is really thanking my friend and colleague, Councilwoman Navarro. Uh, in many ways, this is the culmination of a life's worth of work for her, uh, from being both a direct service provider to an advocate as a mom, uh, to working her way through the Board of Education, becoming the, the president of this body, not once, but twice, uh, and leading us in her first year uh, of this 19th County Council as setting forth a priority that has led a vision in partnership with the executive branch that is truly extraordinary uh, and one of the many legacies that she will leave behind. Um, and so I just wanna thank you publicly and I will a billion more times over the next 10 months, Nancy, um, for all that you've done in so many different ways. So with that, I yield back to you, uh, Chairman Rice, but I do also want to acknowledge the incredible internal team uh, within our county government who did a lot of heavy lifting to get us here as well. Um, our office worked with your office and Councilman Navarro office, as well as the central office, uh, and all of our colleagues have uh, provided feedback and input into this in ways that are really helpful. It's been a tremendous collaboration uh, and while there's still some details that we're going to work through today, I'm confident we will work through them as we have all along collaboratively. Thank you, Chairman Rice. I turn it back to you. Well, thank you very much, Council President. And as always, uh, you teed it up perfectly well. Uh, I'm going to turn to Council Member Navarro, but I did just want to say thank you to our staff, uh, Vivian Yao and to Bob Drummer, uh, who've done an amazing job in really being able to compile all of this together for us that came from visions uh, to now reality. And so that's not easy. <laughs> and so really want to thank uh, each of you for your great work. So let me turn it over to Councilmember Navarro. Thank you, colleagues. And it's so good to see everybody here. This is such an important moment. Um, wow. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. And I am so grateful to everyone who has been diligent in putting together um, so many components of our early care and education initiative. This is one of those components. Um, I, I do want to acknowledge um, my Deputy Chief of Staff, Berta Sersosimo, who um, has been really instrumental in helping me uh, through my service on the County Council to get some of these pieces together so that we can arrive at this, at this particular moment. Uh, and um, it's interesting because Actually, we were having a conversation about a story that I always, you know, share that um, when my husband and I bought our first home in Wheaton, uh, you know, of course, being an immigrant myself, very difficult when you have a child in this country because you don't have your extended family. And my mom was able to come for a, for a year 
but then she had to go back. And she actually took my daughter with her for four months to Venezuela because we had just purchased a home and I was trying to secure childcare. It was so, so, so expensive. I literally cried every night for four months while my daughter was, was there. And uh, when I went to pick her up and bring her back, we began the process of trying to find quality, affordable, accessible childcare. And I was not successful. And after dropping her off at a family childcare program, uh, my last, you know, vision of her was just her staring at me like, what are you doing? And I literally started driving up Georgia Avenue. This was in Belpre Road. Made a U-turn, went back, paid the lady and said, thank you. I took her home and I called my husband on the way home and I said, I'm quitting my job and I'm staying home. And of course, it's like, what? We just bought a house. You know, we're just starting out. And I share that story because, you know, everyone has a personal story about childcare and about the challenges um, finding childcare, that has not gone away. Uh, and that challenge in terms of the national discourse has not gone away because it's still very much tied to personal responsibility. And we know that that's impossible. Uh, and so what we're doing, I think it's not going to be perfect. It's not gonna solve this issue, which by the way, has been exacerbated because of this pandemic, no doubt. Um, but I think that, you know, for me, the reason why a lot of my work has been centered around early care and education as, as a consumer, as a practitioner, as an advocate, as a policymaker, because I became a family child care provider for three years so I could stay home and, and, and you know, we could pay for our home. Um, the reason why it's been so centered is because I really do believe that many of our policy challenges are rooted in those first five years. That we, if we were able to solve this, this challenge of the first five years in terms of, you know, everybody having access to quality childcare, affordable childcare, that so many issues, we would be really, really ahead. And so I am so grateful to everyone, to, you know, our HHS partners, Vivian Yao, who is such an extraordinary asset in terms of our council staff, Montgomery moving forward for doing something that on the national level is very hard you know, to engage the private sector and make sure to, to, to achieve this notion, this challenge of the private sector understanding why this, important, this is important. That is a huge, huge challenge, you know, nationally. So what they've done is extraordinary. Uh, and, uh, you know, I have to really thank my colleagues in, in, in County Executive Eldridge because the investments that we have made on this early care and education initiative has been historic. Um, this this policy area had been neglected for a while, uh, and uh, we on the council tried many times to infuse, you know, uh, some 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 energy into it, um, but it wasn't comprehensive. There were bills, there were attempts. It wasn't comprehensive, and this administration, you know, decided to partner and to make this something that would be scalable and that would be sustainable. That is really important. And so, yeah, as I leave the county council, I feel great that now we are going to address this piece, this very important piece um, of having an entity that will serve as um, making sure that things are going in the direction that we need to go to find ways to bring some uh, philanthropic dollars and some private funding. Think of innovative ways to, for us to promote this and continue to expand this issue. I've been saying this Lately, I really believe that what we are experiencing with this pandemic, a lot of this will be permanent in terms of the disruption that has occurred. I don't think that we can put the genie back in the bottle, but that just means that we have an opportunity to be innovative and it means that we have an opportunity to rethink so many things. Uh, but we, it takes a lot of courage, I think, and it takes a willingness for leadership to be innovative and recognize that. And I think that's why we're finding a lot of tension in our communities right now is because everybody thinks that we're just going to go back to the way things were. And there's frustration around that. But the reality is that systems have been disrupted. And I think many components are permanent disruptions. And so the space of early care and education can be transformative. And, uh, and this particular piece, I think, um, will help us, will set us up nicely to then really, truly rethink uh, early care and education with the help of the state, of course, and with the help of the federal government 
And I'm so pleased that the Biden administration finds this to be, of course, a, a big priority. I know First Lady Biden, Jill Biden, has always made this a priority. She came to talk to us when I was a White House commissioner on this issue of early care and education. So we have a very, very amazing opportunity right now to align all of this and really run with it and take it to the next level. Thank you for allowing me to almost make a little presentation <laughs> going down memory lane on so many issues, but I think it's important because a lot of times we don't take the, we don't take the time to reflect on um, how it is that we sometimes arrive at certain places. Uh, and when people try to rush things, sometimes we miss the mark. So again, everybody here, I, I just wanna say thank you. I can't wait to see how this will all um, move forward and so excited to have Ms. Tread Vance here as well, who will no doubt be extraordinary in pushing this and taking it to, to, to the place that it needs, needs to be taken to. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Councilmember Navarro. And I know that for some of the public that's watching at home, they're wondering what's going on as this seems to be a love fest. Um, but let me just say that behind the scenes, there is a lot of work. And there was a lot of push uh, in both directions. Amen, Joanne Barnes. <laughs> that, you, you, you know, this is, this is one where uh, behind the scenes, there's so many things that go on, so many conversations that happen. Uh, Sharon knows all too well, you know, these are the kinds of things that when we get to this point, and I want the public to just understand that we don't just come to this point via no work with just a proposal. Um, just for the sheer fact of getting to where we are today took years, uh, took years of work uh, behind the scenes. I remember attending something at uh, Montgomery Moving Forward that was back at the Discovery Center. How long has Discovery been? <laughs> you know, I mean, that was what, four or five years ago, Sharon, at least? Um, so, you know, this is one of those, because I think it was when Dr. Pollard was new to Montgomery College. And I, and I want to give a shout out to uh, our institutes of uh, higher education, both Montgomery College and USG, um, for their great support uh, in being able to be a partner in this as well. So it's private sector, it's higher ed, it's Montgomery County Public Schools, uh, all of us together in the private sector uh, and government coming together to really wrap our heads around what it is that we need to try and accomplish. And so again, thank you uh, to everyone. Um, so now for today, what I'd like for us to do to level set uh, Mr. Co-Chair and for my colleagues uh, on the joint committees is today will be an opportunity for us to talk about some of these decision points. Um, my expectation is, is that we may not make decisions on all of these decision points today. Uh, and I wanna level set that. Uh, I wanna talk about things like membership. I wanna talk about some of the other responsibilities that are there, all those kinds of things, and flush out some of the concerns that have been raised by both public as well as our partners and stakeholders that are here today. And then I'd like for us to schedule another meeting to where we actually, now that we've flushed out and identified what those decision points are, and then actually take votes on what those are. Now, if there are things that are very clear that come up where the joint committee is uh, convinced that this is a direction we go in, we can certainly uh, knock those off so that we don't have to revisit them. I, I'd love for us to do that, but I don't wanna put too much pressure on us because this is something that is incredibly important. And I wanna make sure that we can try and get it right and give us an opportunity to really understand and digest uh, some of the, uh, uh, and I wanna say repercussions because that seems to be more negative, but some of the puts and takes that come about for the decisions that we'll make. Uh, and so from that perspective, I just wanted to put that out there. Also, I wanna remind folks that we do have, uh, like I had said before in the opening remarks, the current commission blueprint for education uh, uh, requirements that are out there and those have to change. Uh, quite honestly, there isn't a single jurisdiction in the state of Maryland that is in compliance with where the blueprint is right now in terms of what it's asking for systems to have. Uh, and so because of that, there will have to be some action uh, in Annapolis this year. Uh, and so we have to pay very close attention to that and how that will then impact some of the decisions we make regarding our new early care and education coordinating entity. Uh, and so I want us to be cautious of that as well as we look forward to moving forward. That doesn't mean that we'll have to wait until the end of session uh, to pass this piece of legislation. I think we'll be safe uh, with moving forward, but we do wanna make sure that we're talking about and understanding some of the things that are out there 
uh, in some of the proposals that folks have already put forth as well as may put forth uh, in the coming weeks. So just to kind of, uh, before I turn it over to Vivian and Bob to kind of walk us through the packet, and thank you, uh, Bob and Vivian, for uh, an amazing packet as well. This single nonprofit corporation that is determined to be our county's early care and education coordinating entity uh, will be made up of both government uh, officials as well as private sector uh, folks that will be uh, appointed by the executive, confirmed by the council, uh, and really focused on making the decisions that we know are incredibly important to increasing the availability and access of high quality uh, child care, uh, early care and education programs for uh, this county. And of course, uh, because we have uh, a lovely racial equity and social justice law, um, we know that we need to make sure that we're focusing on uh, underserved, underrepresented populations in our community and how we can deliver for them. Uh, my wife and I were very fortunate to be able to be able to afford uh, high quality childcare that was expensive. Um, and I talk to parents each and every day who are fortunately uh, able to pay exorbitant amounts of money for child care. But there's so many others, as you heard from Councilmember Navarro, when her and her husband moved here and were challenged with figuring out um, how, how to make this work, who have tough decisions each and every day about where they're going to send their children uh, to make sure that they can start off right uh, in terms of being successful right out of the gate. And that is that zero to five window. Uh, it is one that we've paid very close attention to. No longer do we say K to J. Isn't that right, Susan Madden? It's now pre-K to J, uh, from pre-K to job, making sure that we have that set, and that starts from birth. Uh, and so I'm really appreciative to all of the people who, well before uh, I embarked on this work, uh, have been working on this. Folks like Joanne Barnes, folks like Dr. Kroll, Kathy Stevens, and Sharon, and so many others that are here who've been focused on this work for so, so long. So with that, let me turn it over to Vivian and Bob to walk us through some of the salient points. We'll flush out some of those details. Colleagues, please go ahead and text me if you have questions, concerns, uh, uh, and we'll uh, put you in the queue. So with that, let me turn it over to Vivian and Bob. Okay, thank you. I think I'll go through the packet. Um, as everybody's already mentioned, what this bill would do would be require the council to designate by resolution approved by the executive, a single nonprofit corporation to serve as the county's early care and education coordinating entity. Uh, it has, the bill has requirements for members of the board of directors. They would be appointed by the executive and confirmed by the council. Uh, and uh, the duties are outlined in the uh, in the uh, bill itself. Uh, we had a public hearing, which was got a lot of positive support. Unlike the police accountability bill that we had the other night. Um, I'm going to go through, I'll go through the issues in the order there in the packet, unless somebody wants to take it out of order. Uh, the first issue is the fiscal and economic impact of the bill. The fiscal impact um, needs to be understood that this is not a normal county board or commission. Uh, it's going to create a separate, a separate uh, independent nonprofit organization that's probably closer to the Economic Development Corporation in, in organization type. Uh, that's something else where the council designated a nonprofit to serve as the Economic Development Corporation. So uh, OMB went through and did some analysis on what it would take. It's gonna require uh, paid staff while the board members would be working uh, on a volunteer basis. Uh, for the most part, uh, the, they would need a professional staff. They would need office space. They would need everything else that any ongoing organization needs. Uh, a Zoom account these days, you need that too. 
Um, and uh, they've estimated that that would cost, oh, they also estimated that the HHS would need to create a new position to work with this board to oversee what would be a, a contract between the uh, corporation and the county uh, to operate. So including the new position and what they estimate the cost would be, they came up to about $600,000 a year. And that's an annual basis. That's not a, uh, you know, one-time cost. So it's a recurring cost. Uh, anybody want to, any questions about that, about the estimate? Yeah, we'll actually go, go in order of okay. use of them. I, I think that'll be a little bit easier because then we can flush them out that that way and then say we'll come back to or whatever. I've got uh, uh, President Albert Oates, Mr. Co-Chair. Uh, thank you, Chairman Rice. I, I don't at all dispute the fiscal analysis. I'll note, however, that, um, you know, the vision is, is that we look at an existing organization that would be repurposed uh, to be able to carry forward this work, thus making it somewhat uh, cost neutral. And it also obviously doesn't take into account nor understandably uh, can it at this point, the opportunity cost that lies before us, there are already uh, some uh, interest been, that has been shown by some uh, very significant foundations uh, who may look to make investments in an organization like this rather than a government entity. So I think the, the fiscal impact, uh, there are some raw numbers that are straightforward in terms of staff and personnel, um, but I just wanted to provide that broader context, which I think is important. And, and, and so colleagues, because this is so nuanced in terms of all of the individual pieces, what I will ask is that we do stop and go over each one item by item instead of waiting until the end like we typically do uh, with this because they are so specific. Um, I don't want folks to lose kind of, you know, place for what it is. So does anybody else have any comments about uh, the uh, fiscal impacts and the additional position? Go ahead, Councilmember Navarro. Yes, I do want to associate myself with what uh, Council President Albernos mentioned. I think that was part of the discussion that we all had when we were um, thinking through this proposal. Obviously, we have the Children Opportunity Fund. It was envisioned uh, many years ago when the when that um, fund was um, established that that would be the place where we were going to practice, uh, you know, how something like this could evolve. Um, and I think staying true to that intention. The idea, I think, will be to um, explore how to almost, you know, evolve this uh, Children Opportunity Fund into this particular entity. Um, I, I think that is going to be important, and I think that the, again, original conversations was that we would try to figure out a way to make this as much as a cost-neutral endeavor because it is part of this evolution. Um, so I want to register that that's how I had understood the proposal as well. And, and for my colleagues, I want to make sure that DHHS, uh, MMF, other folks have an opportunity. So please use the raise your hand feature. Or just let it in chat. And if there's anybody who'd like to speak, Dr. Crowell, did you want to respond? Oh, you're muted. Good morning, Council uh, Chairman, uh, Chairman Rice and Council President Albernoz and, and, and Council members. Um, a couple of conversation comments throughout this as we go forward, but but for this piece, just to say that 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 our operating assumption around this is that we needed to certainly figure out what the cost would be for the county at this point, knowing that there is some uncertain future about in terms of alternative funding and, and other kinds of fundings that that are, that are uh, uh, that might come in from philanthropy or other sources. So this represents the OMB's best estimate of what the costs are based on, on what we have available to us at this point. Um, and I think that that's a, that, so it's a fair estimate. I think you have those, those, those numbers in the, in the packet elsewhere. So, and I, I have other comments that I want to make, but I want, I want to try to honor your, your framework and going through this, uh, step by step. And so there'll be some opportunity for me to say some things at, at some, at some point in the process. Absolutely. Well, let's dispense of this one, Dr. Kroll, and I apologize. I should have actually uh, had, 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 had given you the opportunity to do the same as well. So um, let's dispense of this item. Uh, any other comments or thoughts around this? Again, we're not going to take votes today, but, but it'll be uh, 
uh, important just to flush out these kind of ideas. Uh, Count, uh, Council Vice President Glass. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, so uh, I appreciate all the, the tee up to this conversation and all the hard work that my colleagues and uh, and everybody else has done to get us to this point. Uh, it's really exciting. And and to this one point uh, about the, the costs, I'm curious, and I see that Mr. Beverly had his hand up, so he'll go next. He'll probably answer the question I'm curious about because since uh, – since the uh, initial framework was that the Children's Opportunity Fund housed some of this, I'm, I'm curious if that is the expectation from the Children's Opportunity Fund and the Community Foundation. Mr. Reveley. Uh, uh, gosh, am I, I'm not muted. <laughs> Good afternoon, all. Um, my question uh, in response to, to Council Member Glass's uh, comment, the Children's Opportunity Fund, which I currently serve as the, uh, the chair of that steering committee, um, has been uh, in conversations and working closely with MMF as this has unfolded. So uh, they have been preparing for, as uh, Councilmember Navarro said, uh, the extension of where this would lead them. Uh, the Community Foundation, I think, had been a great place for the experiment to begin. Um, they, they demonstrated uh, a fiscal, as a fiscal agent, how something like this could work and allowed um, the Children's Opportunity Fund to go out. And, and the pandemic gave us a great opportunity to see how it would behave, um, going out and being able to find and secure private funding that helped uh, support the public funding, which was the majority of what came through. Uh, to um, to actually demonstrate what we could do in a, a situation where not only on a day-to-day -day basis, but actually in crisis. So um, I think they're ready and prepared. The budget. Uh, my only comment about the budget would be again, I, and I'm not sure how how it came to be, but there's certainly some components of it that are probably understated in terms of costs that you you really are going to have to think about as you try to build out an organization that's going to do all the things that you're that, that's the, that are in the bill. Vice President Glass, back to you, sir. Oh, uh, Mr. Beverly has always answered my question, uh, and so I am I'm satisfied. So thank you. Thank you very much. Sir. Ms. Stevens, I saw your hand up as well. So I think Sharon uh, hand is up, and I'm going to let her speak for us on this one. Okay. Sharon. You're, you're muted, Sharon. There we go. Oh, my, my uh, technology. Uh, so I did want to say uh, that, you know, um, Montgomery moving forward when we submitted recommendations uh, to council, um, many of which helped to underpin this wonderful legislation we're talking about today, we did submit um, a, a, a draft budget. And I was pleased to see that when um, the budget was analyzed, um, as Dr. Crow mentioned, it was very much, the expenses were very much in concert with what we recommended in our initial recommendations. So I think that's a very good thing. And as we move forward, um, I think having been laid out then by community, by government, all of the things that we're talking about from the government funding perspective will certainly be taken into consideration. But I do want to mention, and this is exciting news, that there is indeed interest from the private sector in funding an independent early care and education entity. We have received a $50,000 commitment from the Bender Family Foundation to stand up the entity. So the initial stand up, and that is a $50,000 um, uh, offer for a match for another $50,000. And we've been very lucky. We're almost at that $100,000. Um, and that comes through the largesse um, of the Jay Willard and Alice Marriott Foundation, um, the Healthcare Initiative Foundation, Comcast, and Bob Buchanan. So the other thing that I would say is I do think that given this initial interest by the private sector, they have indicated that should the entity be stood up successfully and continues, which we all hope it will in a successful way, there would be interest in sustained funding for the entity in addition to the public sector funding. So that is exciting. If we can mirror 
in all aspects of this entity from the everything from the board membership to the funding um, to the policy uh, this public private partnership is going to be really great so thank you well thank you very much uh, Ms. Ms. Friedman that is uh, very promising news and not only that I I did just want to highlight one of the things that Councilmember Navarro said earlier uh, when she referenced about our federal partners and uh, the White House uh, with Build Back Better. And, um, you know, folks folks who are paying very close attention to the uh, words that were being used by the president, uh, to me and to many who are analyzing this, uh, believe that there will be now a different proposal that comes out via Build Back Better. Now, how much money that still leaves towards uh, child tax credits or towards uh, the early care and education uh, components, we're not sure. Um, we know that some of these things will be scaled back significantly, uh, but even additional money is still additional money. Uh, and so from that standpoint, our hope is that with some passage of something uh, will give us additional money as well coming through the federal government, through the state, uh, to uh, our local jurisdiction to be able to help in this effort as well. So not only do we also have the private philanthropy dollars, and thank you very much, uh, MMF, uh, for continuing to work with partners in the community, uh, but we also have government funding potential that is out there as well. So I think that that's very promising. Again, colleagues, we don't have to make a decision today, but we've gotten a lot of feedback uh, so it will be one of the decision points that we list. Uh, so Bob and Vivian, if we can list that as one of the things in terms of assuming whether or not we will have uh, this actual position or do we think that it may be covered by uh, the money that we see that's being raised via, via uh, private philanthropy dollars to be able to cover uh, so that we don't have to uh, worry about that budget. All right, Mr. Drummer, that was the first one. Uh, but before we do that, uh, I did want to uh, allow Dr. Kroll, uh, our Director of uh, Health and Human Services, who certainly has also uh, borne some of the long, uh, late night calls about <laughs> ECE, <laughs> just as Ms. Barnes has, and I uh, want to give you an opportunity, sir. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Rice, Chairman Rice. Uh, you know, I, I just want to say a couple of things. Thank you to 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 you, uh, Councilmember Navarro, and for the partnership you, with the County Executive and it's in giving us the ECEI um, four years ago now, give or take a little bit, maybe a little more, four years ago. Uh, and I have been uh, a psychologist for 40 years. Um, in, in this in this world, and I have never seen a level of concentrated and focused commitment on on early child care at the level that I've seen it in Montgomery County. And I am, um, it is, um, it's it's a it's an exciting moment for me. I just just professionally to, to see this kind of this kind of work, and I'm grateful for the work that you all have put into this and, and leading this charge. Um, there is a, um, a Japanese word called kiki that translates roughly into. Uh, risk and opportunity, uh, and clearly, um, the, the this is one of those moments where there is an opportunity. COVID has demonstrated the needs and the gaps that we have in our system, and and the dire need for for changes in our and in, in growth and development in our in our child care system. Uh, and this is a moment where we have both an opportunity to change some things and to to the potential to make it better. And I'm I'm hopeful that this takes us down that path. Um, Nothing in this legislation, I think, proposed legislation, takes away from the good work that has been done by the Early Child Care Coordinating Co uh, Committee Council and, and Joanne Barnes and her tenure and the team, uh, Dr. Andrews, uh, and, their, and their work over the years. I think this is about building on what has been done and, and, uh, and growing it into something new and, and, and uh, more dynamic, I, I'm hoping especially proud of the work on racial equity and social justice uh, and addressing the needs of those folks who are who are most vulnerable in, in the county. My hope, my expectation is that is that what comes out of this legislation will honor that work and, and, and will continue the ongoing work uh, and partnership with HHS and the county in, uh, in, in building uh, a system uh, for, uh, for, for our children and for, for, the, for the residents who live in the county. It is, um, Child care is a challenge, and to Councilmember Navarro's point, it is one of the challenges that has been left largely to the individuals and the households. And I think both there's national 
energy around this, there's local state energy around this, and there's local energy clearly that makes this moment the moment to 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 try to drive something forward that actually helps to improve the the opportunities for our children zero to five. Um, I'm a developmental psychologist. I'm a child psychologist. Um, that, that does not mean I'm 12. It means that <laughs> I am. Uh, I focus most of my career on children. But what it does mean is that is that I understand the development, the needs for healthy development and for opportunities in those first five years of life. They are among the most important years in in uh, in human being in human development. So. I'm looking forward to working with you all on this. Um, there are a lot of details and a lot of nuances. The devil is always in the details, and we will always be wrestling with those and try to figure out how this works. My goal is for us to get something launched and running as, as it is yours, and then to look back and, and, and look at it as it evolves and make the changes necessary to make it um, as perfect as we can. So with that, I'll yield back to you, Council Member. Looking forward to the conversation. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Kroll, and I know that some of our partners uh, want to have some comments as well. We're going to go through some of the questions first, and then I'll turn to them uh, to give some comments once we have a grasp of all of the different things that are before us. I want to dispense and make sure that we get to all those salient points, and then we'll uh, talk about some of the overarching views and the collective uh, nature of the bill as a whole. So with that, Bob, I turn it back to you, sir. Okay. Uh before we leave, number one, I just want to point out, we did get an economic impact statement from the Office of Legislative Oversight. Um, as you might expect, they couldn't find a direct link between this bill and the economic conditions in the county. And I don't think anybody was expecting a direct link. It would be an indirect link that on the assumption, and it is an assumption, I suppose, based on a lot of work and a lot of thought um, given by people other than me um, that uh, this would result in more quality, accessible child education, early childhood education in the county. If that's true, then there would be a positive link with the economic conditions. I think uh, OLO acknowledged that, but they're not in a position to make that jump based on the bill itself. Uh, number two, as uh, several people have mentioned and Dr. Crowell mentioned, uh, we already have the Early Childhood Coordinating Council, which is a county board of sorts. Uh, it's called a council, but it's a county board of, with appointees that work you know, with county staff, I believe with HHS staff. And many of the duties are quite similar to what this entity's duties would be. And uh, that's something that was, I noticed it and I don't work in this field particularly. And uh, I, the county attorney's office noticed it as well. Uh, so here you got two lawyers basically saying the same thing. That's unusual in itself. Um, and, uh, so there's, there's an issue as, and it obviously doesn't have to be done in this bill and it doesn't have to be done now, uh, but if you're going to keep both organizations, uh, how are we going to divide up their duties and how are they going to both work together and not work at cross purposes and do we need both? So um, that's another, uh, that's the second issue. Is. Let, me, let me stop there for a moment, Bob, because I did want to give, I know, Dr. Kroll, you had some thoughts on this with uh, ECCC, so uh, I'll turn to you first, and then if any of my colleagues have uh, thoughts about this as well, just please text me, or you can just raise your hand. Uh, sure. sure, thank you, and I may I may uh, turn to Ms. Barnes and maybe Dr. Dr. Andrews for a little bit of additional comment on this, but I think that, that uh, you're right that there is some overlap in this. Um, and both of these propose a board, but but not they are not necessarily similarly representative. And I think that is one of the one of the concerns that we expressed at, at various points along the way in this process. Um, our think, thinking about this and the way this the legislation is written, I think, is that the ECCC will continue at least into the next year, while the entity is is up and operating. Uh, there are um, uh, and and we'll solicit some input from the from the, the the stakeholders to identify whatever the unmet needs and barriers are. So it's a useful group that have will continue to have some some utility for us. I think there is also um, 
uh, the reality that the EFCCC right now currently serves as the local early child care advisory council that is set up by the state. So they're designated, the EFCCC is designated by the state as that, as that uh, advisory council. And if the entity structure is going to uh, supersede the EFCCC, uh, then that entity board would need to act as the local uh, child care advisory board. So this is something that is, would have to be recognized and agreed to by the state, I presume. So it's something for, for us to put a place marker in and a reminder that there is a role that the EFCCC still plays in this, in this process. Um, the, the, there is a question um, um, about the, within that framework about the requirements of the state ECAC in relation to the membership of the board that would need to be reviewed as, as part of that process, I think. Uh, the other thing I think is, 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 is to note that the EFCCC is large, intentionally large, I think, to, to uh, and modeled after the state um, advisory council to be representative of all parts of the early child care and education system. So there's, a, there's an issue of racial equity and social justice that needs to get addressed and be clearly addressed, and economic uh, diversity that needs to get clearly addressed in, in the constellation of the board. Um, and I'm um, hopeful that, that that is something that uh, this the entity board can manage, but I think it is something we have to watch um, and is a reason for the ECCC to continue to function at, at whatever level within, within, in the coming year. So before I turn, and, and, and thank you very much, Dr. Kroll, before I turn to my co-chair, uh, Council President Albert Noves, let me just say uh, that I agree with the finding that um, we'll need to at least keep this uh, for uh, uh, temporary, at least for, as you said, for a year as we start up the entity just to make sure that if we decide that there is a transition, uh, that transition should be smooth, uh, should enable some of the folks who we know may want to continue to serve in this other capacity to be able to switch over as well, uh, all of those things, and that we get the representation that we want to have. That's going to be discussion a little bit later in terms of the composition of the board, and there have been a lot of questions about that as well, and some uh, thoughts around changing some of that uh, also. So from that standpoint, uh, I do agree that having the entity for a year uh, makes sense uh, for us moving forward, but I uh, certainly want to turn it over to my co-chair, uh, Council President Albert Noves. Uh, thank you, Chair Rice. You said it well. There's no question that we all acknowledge and can't thank enough the ECCC uh, for their steadfast dedication over a number of years. And when you do look at the makeup of the board, it is um, a wonderful cross-section of organizations and providers and individuals who've uh, really invested a lot personally and professionally in this space. And so as we, we want to provide this uh, organization, this new entity with some uh, prescribed uh, angles and leadership where we, where we know we want them to go, but also give them a long enough runway uh, to be able to figure out how specifically to uh, evolve uh, and ensure that we are expanding our efforts, expanding our reach, leveraging our existing resources even better than we are right now. And I'll just note that, um, you know, there is an expectation and we'll discuss uh, more specifically uh, representation within HHS, but HHS will continue to be that incredibly important link uh, between the ECCC and this newly formed group as they are involved in the development coming out of the gates uh, after those critically important initial meetings uh, that, that are going to be really important. So I think absolutely it makes sense, uh, particularly in the state of transition, and then yet to be determined on exactly what it will look like uh, after we give folks a long enough runway to be able to figure it out. Ms. Ms. Friedman, I saw you nodding, but certainly with MMF, I wanted to give you an opportunity to speak on this as well. Yes, um, I too agree um, with the comments that have been made about the importance of the continuation, certainly in the next year of the ECCC. They bring tremendous expertise um, in the early childhood field, from family child care to center-based child care to parents. And I think that they'll be infinitely important uh, in helping to inform the work of the entity. That said, I do think that one of the first things that the entity should take on is a look at the early care and education space and all the many organizations that are currently involved in that space. 
when um, definitions and roles and responsibilities um, can be looked at um, for all the various different players so that, in fact, um, in the end, we have a system that is collaborative, not duplicative, um, and one that allows um, the expertise um, from all the various different sectors to enable the entity to be successful. So totally in agreement with what the legislation speaks to having the ECCC continue. I think Dr. Crowell also um, maintains and raises issues that would need to be addressed if the ECCC um, uh, state functions were to become part of the entity. But this, this year allows us the wonderful expertise and support of the ECCC and them to actually help the entity uh, figure out how to move forward. And one other thing that I would say is, I know that we're going to be talking about membership, but, you know, the membership of the board of directors of the new entity will very much, should very much reflect both family uh, child care providers, center-based child care providers, and parents. Um, extraordinarily important voices, and to the degree that not every single person can serve on the board, there does need to be a continuing set of advisory groups that help inform the work of that board. Yeah, I'm, I, I, Ms. Ms. Friedman, I'm, I'm really happy that you said that because I couldn't agree with you more. I think that there are so many opportunities that go well beyond the board of directors uh, that still give folks an opportunity to serve, to have their voices heard, to play a part in the decision-making process, as well as individuals who will be a part of that board of directors as well. So I couldn't agree with you more. I couldn't agree with all the comments that have been there. Let me turn to Council Member Navarro. Thank you, um, Sharon. I'm so glad that you mentioned that. I I want to make sure that we can, you know, constantly remember some of the responsibilities, I guess, or our ultimate goals, I, I should say. And I know the Racial Equity and Social Justice Act was 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 mentioned. The truth of the matter is that we know now more than ever that we have some extraordinary gaps, um, and especially in particular geographic areas of the county, especially, you know, affecting disproportionately a lot of low-income black and brown children. Um, and we also know the demographic profile of the uh, providers um, pretty much, you know, what it is. Uh, we have a lot of immigrant providers. We have a lot of black and brown providers, et cetera. And I know that in the past, some of the feedback that I would get from providers when it came to participating in particular um, you know, work groups or task forces or child care associations and things like that was this notion that they did not feel necessarily welcome or that their voices were not necessarily um, taken into consideration. And so I want to make sure that however, you know, whatever the mechanics are, these are, you know, this is, we're getting in the weeds now, it's more of a technical thing, <laughs> that we are very, very, very careful about you know, who is at the table um, that, that, you know, does there need to be some kind of orientation or something like that? Because we don't want to just have people who are already super well versed and super well, you know, in the circles, et cetera. We want to hear what's happening on the ground, which might mean that we may have some orientation or some mentoring of some sort, but I don't want to create a, for us to inadvertently create a structure where we have those voices in advisory groups versus being at the table. I mean, to be honest, that's one of the reasons why I decided to run for the Board of Education. I was tired to, of, of being in work groups and, and, and commissions. I wanted to be at the table where decisions were made. And that was a long time ago. So imagine the demographic changes that have occurred. Um, so, you know, I agree with how this is being framed. Um, I think that's more technical. I just want to make sure that we focus on the ultimate goal, which is to ensure that the decisions that are being made are also made by voices that reflect both the practitioners as well as especially the children who we know right now are just not even in quality uh, care, you know, uh, early care and education. Um, so just wanted to put that on the record um, and um, look forward to seeing how, you know, especially our staff, I constantly look at them as Yao, et cetera, because, you know, I think they, uh, I think she knows this, HHS knows this, I know, Montgomery Moving Forward knows this, and they can give us the best possible proposals um, so that we make sure that we are doing that and being true to our Racial Equity and Social uh, Justice Act. 
Well, thank you very much, Councilmember Navarro. I couldn't agree with you more. And I think that I saw the nodding heads that agree as well. So I think we're all on the same page there. Ms. Friedman, did you want to add something else? I'm sorry, sorry. No, okay. Okay, just want to make sure. Um, oh, Mr. Beverly, sure. I, I wanted to just highlight uh, Sharon's point because I think it's important and that what Mr. Drummer has done in highlighting the ECCC uh, in the work that MMF was doing, part of what came out of there was not only the ECCC, but there are other organizations that uh, present particular conflicts and have long histories of doing work. And uh, hopefully the legislation can help as we go through this process clean up some of the relationships that are with other organizations. I mean, we've highlighted the ACCC, but there, you know, the Collaboration Council that has a foot in this as well that you have to consider. And so I think they all, in terms of creating an environment where collaboration really can happen, is to make sure that all those parties have uh, an opportunity to uh, be reviewed. Yeah, so I think one of the things that will be helpful from what I'm hearing is is that we need to have that list of, of, of those. So for our next meeting, Vivian and Bob, what I'd like to do is be able to just compile a list of all of those that we think do have that cross-sectional jurisdiction uh, when it comes to that so that we can identify. And then some kind of way, again, it's not going to be hard and fast in terms of saying that, you know, our new coordinating entity supersedes. But we can say that needs to work in collaboration with or something along those lines to ensure that there's that cross communication. And then at some point, there may be the discerning, and this is what Sharon was kind of alluding to of, you know, hey, maybe some of these won't be in that role any longer or will be that kind of un underneath that coordinating entity umbrella, right? So that may transition over time to be in that space. So I think that we start off with having an understanding of who our partners are and having a list of those and then saying and listing that they are to work in collaboration with our coordinating entity because that then gives the ability and the formality of the structure so that they are not independent to what Councilmember Navarro was talking about. There needs to be that coordination and consideration and lifting up, but then also uh, what Councilmember Navarro said, which I completely agree with and was alluding to as well, is that we need to provide opportunities for new voices, for new folks to be engaged and involved, uh, to have a seat at the table also, understanding that many people are already in those roles, in these other entities that are out there, but um, are still not giving some of the folks who we know need to have their voices heard or uh, seats at the table the opportunity to have that. So I just wanna make sure that I'm, uh, I see nodding heads, I see Councilmember Navarro nodded her head. I just want to make sure for my colleagues, Councilmember Glass and uh, Mr. President. Okay, good. All right, all right. So, so, so I think that's where we are there. Councilmember Duando, good. Okay, all right. Um, so, uh, with that, um, I, I did just want to acknowledge uh, Miss Edwards uh, from Montgomery County Public Schools, who is our director of so district-wide services and supports. Did I get it right? Good afternoon, Council Member Rice and Dana Edwards, uh, Chief of District Wise Services and Supports. There were elements of it there, yes. There you go. <laughs> I, I got it close. <laughs> yes, yes. So thank you very much for being here, Ms. Edwards, as well. I had mentioned MCPS before, but didn't specifically mention you, so I wanted to make sure uh, that, that, that I acknowledge you as well. And thank you very much for being here, one of our key partners uh, with Montgomery County Public Schools. So thank you for that. Um, let me turn back to you, Mr. Drummer. Councilmember Rice, before before you do that, I just oh, wanted oh, to just, oh, sorry. Yeah, just okay. I just want I just want just just wanted to register once again that one of the things about the the and this is, is I think the conversation has made it clear that one of the things about the ECCC being intentionally large is precisely because of the variety of groups that have some stake in that process, and those stakes are not going to go away under an entity, but it's a question of how does the entity then acknowledge and recognize those voices. Um, and I think we, I think there's a conversation on membership that'll come up a little bit later, but, um, but I, and we'll talk more about that then, but I did want to register that this is, it is a statement about just how entirely complex early child care and education is in, in, in the county. I couldn't agree with you more. Yes, uh, that, that will certainly be one of the longer discussion points for us. So um, with that, let me turn to uh, Mr. Drummer to walk us through our next item about ex officio. The bill would require 
25 board members, 13 of them would be ex officio members who are there because of their position, not appointed individually. And most of those positions are in county government. Uh, I think there's a couple in uh, schools, in MCPS, and I'm not sure if there are others, but there might be. Um, and the, the issue which was brought up by the county attorney's office uh, is one of conflict of interest. If you're working for HHS and that's your job, you've got a responsibility to HHS. If because of your job, we put you on this board of a nonprofit corporation, you've got an ethics issue uh, in doing anything um, in working with the board in your job at HHS because the ethics law generally prohibits the county employee or public employee from uh, working on any matter of, with an organization on which they're a member of the board of directors. Uh, that has come up in the past and we've told county employees that they can't work on those matters. Well, that's going to be a problem if you're putting people on the board who actually that's their job is to work on early child care. Um, well, then they're not going to be able to, to, to do on, do anything um, that involves this entity. Um, so this, there is a solution. There's a technical solution. There's an exception in the ethics law to state that if the employee is put on the board to represent the public interest, uh, that that takes you out of that ethics prohibition. Now, to be clear, it does resolve the question in the ethics law, but it is awkward you're going to have people on the board who owe their loyalty to this general public interest and not to the corporation they're a member of the board. Uh, will that make a difference in practice? I don't know. I'm not smart enough to figure out what, you know, all the permutations that's going to happen, but, um, but it is awkward. It's, it, it's less awkward if you're talking about, you know, 10% of your board. But if you're talking about more than half your board, uh, it, it is definitely awkward. Um, but I did provide a, an amendment. It's on page five of the uh, staff report, which would take you out of the, uh, would take each of these government employees out of the ethics uh, question, the, you know, conflict of interest that they would otherwise have. So it, if you're going to continue with the ex officio board members, I would recommend you do this. Otherwise, they're going to have an ethics issue. Um, so, you know, the law doesn't require you to be subject to the county ethics law just because you're on the board. But if you're a county employee, you're already subject to the county ethics law, not, you know, without regard to being on the board. So you're still in that in that vice, so to speak. Understood. Understood. Let me turn to uh, President Albernos, Mr. Co-Chair. Uh, I appreciate the assessment, Bob. You did a, a good job as always, and I think the amendment makes a lot of sense. I'll just note this is not irregular. Um, uh, Dr. Kroll. Ms. Barnes and I have all okay. served on the Collaboration Council board uh, when we were government yes. employees. Uh, and I'll also note the Public's Art Trust, which is run by the Montgomery County um, Arts and Humanities Council, has government entities. That's a multi-million dollar budget. Um, and the MCEDC uh, has representatives from county government on its board as ex, ex officio members, including our colleague, Council Member Friedson. So this is not unusual. Um, I'll, I think the amendment will address uh, the potential awkwardness of this, but um, it, it will be important for there to be a fusion 
so that we can have a collaborative discussion in a way that's reasonable. And no system is perfect, as was noted earlier by Councilmember Navarro, um, but I do think that there are many examples, and I just gave you the ones off the top of my head, some of which I've served on personally as the Director of uh, Recreation, uh, and it did work. Uh, and it was when Collaboration Council is a good example. Um, it was just this a unique time and place uh, for people who focusing focusing on children, youth, and family issues get together, uh, and some really great things have happened over a number of years. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Council President. I think that's a great example, and I think that again, Bob, thank you very much for uh, the amendment. I think that with what uh, the Council President listed, <clears throat> excuse me, and with the amendment, I think that will be in uh, safe space. So any other comments, questions, concerns about that amendment? Um, Comment to add that yes, WorkSource, yes, please, uh, just WorkSource Montgomery and WIB are two more examples of where that where, where there is that kind of membership on the board. And so, uh, and it does work well to Council Member Alvarez's point. Excellent. So colleagues, let me just ask, because this is more technical, um, if, if we'd like to go ahead and dispense of this in terms of just uh, acknowledging and putting forth the amendment so that we can have that in the packet for next week. Is there objection to the amendment from anyone or any questions or concerns about the amendment? Can we just state the amendment again? So we yes, know it is. absolutely. Yeah. I can, uh, oh, oh, Bob, do you want to read it? And, yeah, it? It's on the top of page five and it would simply state that uh, each member appointed from the public sector as an ex officio member represents the public interest and is not preclu precluded from participating in a matter as a board member if that member's government employer is a party to the matter. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Gilando. So any, any questions, concerns about that amendment? And hearing none, then we'll go ahead and dispense of that. That's an easier one because I do see it as more of a technical amendment just to make sure that we're addressing an issue there. So thank you very much, Bob, uh, for highlighting that. And thank you, Council President. So we can dispense of that item. So that will just be included in our next packet uh, as amended. Um, with that, uh, let me turn back to you, Bob, for our next item. All right, the next item is uh, number four. And this goes to, uh, well, one of the goals that I read um, about this organization was to have an organization independent from the county. And that's why, you know, the bill requires the designation of a nonprofit corporation. And the question is, is how independent is this going to be if all the board members are appointed by the executive, confirmed by the council, and a majority of the board members are there because of their position uh, in various government agencies. Is that really independent or is that just some sort of extension? And I know there's a concept of public-private partnership, and I know that's what you're trying to do. Uh, I'm just pointing that out. That's not a legal uh, objection. It's just a policy question to ponder that maybe you don't want a majority of your board members to be ex officio uh, public sector appointed because of their government positions. So thank you, Bob, for laying this out. Uh, uh, colleagues, I think that we're going to spend uh, a bit of time on this topic. I'll start off and then just please uh, just text me and let me know. Uh, you're uh, willing, you want to chime in. I see that Council President Albernos, I've got you next. Um, but certainly did just want to give you my thoughts on this. I see you, Council Member Jawando, as well. I've got you on the list. Um, so when it, when it comes to uh, the entity, what Council Member Navarro said uh, at the beginning is something that I believe is incredibly important. And while I certainly respect and honor the work of our Department of Health and Human Services, uh, I respect and honor the work of some of our other government entities that are on board. I feel as though that, um, you know, the number doesn't represent the weight uh, that the entity carries. Uh, DHHS is certainly one of our largest uh, public sector uh, government entities, only second to Montgomery County Public Schools in terms of budget, but certainly larger when it comes in size. 
uh, in terms of uh, what uh, DHHS represents. So whether it had four members or three members uh, doesn't really matter. Uh, the weight of the organization still uh, is significant. And uh, as we are the uh, designated body budgetarily and when it comes to uh, for policy for DHHS, when it comes to legislative policy, uh, those are things that, again, are dictated uh, a lot by government. Uh, and so from that standpoint, uh, I would feel comfortable with a shift uh, and making sure that some of these positions are actually there for some of the people that Councilmember Navarro was talking about uh, and ensuring that we have more of that voice that's there and more opportunity uh, for those individuals. And so that's just kind of where I stand. Again, this isn't something where we're going to decide the exact numbers today. This is an idea for us to start floating ideas around what people might feel comfortable with. Uh, so I'm going to start with my colleagues, uh, my council colleagues first, uh, and then certainly as other folks uh, want to weigh in, Dr. Kroll, I'll turn to you right after uh, my council colleagues and then for uh, my folks with MMF, uh, I'll certainly turn to them after that point as well and then MCPS and, uh, uh, also. So um, with that, let me turn to uh, Council President Albernos, Chair Albernos. Uh, thank you, Chairman Rice. Just for a little bit of context, like everybody on this Zoom, uh, I have had the great opportunity to serve on a number of different boards and commissions over the years. Uh, they've differed in size and makeup, uh, but what has rung true in every board that I've ser served on uh, is, is that inevitably uh, not everybody carries the same level of weight. And uh, having some consistency across the board, especially in the makeup, is more than just symbolic. Uh, it's really important uh, to, to lay forth a path to set the expectations for this body moving forward. And so I agree with Chairman Rice that uh, having a, a, a reasonably higher degree of representation, and that could just be tipping the scales by one or two members, uh, I do think makes sense because it's symbolic. The, the more important thing is that the people appointed, um, particularly from the government agencies, are in some decision-making capacity uh, and that they be given the um, authority uh, to be able to, uh, you know, obviously with uh, upon consultation, within reason, but that they can make decisions in real time and that there can be uh, discourse uh, in real time so that you can really get to the meat of what's happening. And we're going to be very intentional, as we always are, in ensuring that the people that are uh, recruited and onboarded under these positions uh, have a wealth of knowledge and depth and expertise and passion in this space. Um, but, you know, we have to also acknowledge that it's going to evolve over time. Um, but coming out of the gates, uh, I, I do think it makes sense for us to have uh, a slightly larger folks from our private sector. Uh, and when I say private, I, I don't mean, you know, just our business community, um, but I'm talking about folks who are actually in the field operating uh, different uh, types of organizations, as was noted earlier. And, and I also think that, you know, having served in a government function uh, and, and been the appointed person you know, listen, I can speak about this in the first person. Uh, we, we don't, sometimes these can just become another meeting uh, for folks <laughs> uh, that they've been assigned to. Uh, I'm just being real about that. And, and I think that uh, present company excluded all the folks that have served on other boards uh, with me together from government agencies. Um, but I do think it's important for us to, to be able to leverage those private voices in a way that's reasonable. So, I know we'll have more discussion about this. I know there's understandably probably slightly a difference of opinion uh, for my colleagues who work within the executive branch, which I respect. Um, but I think all things being equal, that's where I stand right now. Well, thank you, Council President. And I do just want to note, and it's noted in the packet as well, that the county executive did suggest adding uh, parents and private sector child care providers yes. to the board. He preferred it in the sense of adding additional members to the board instead of taking away. But, you know, the way I look at it is compromise. Uh, and so, you know, we may reach some midland point. Dr. Kroll knows all too well, and I believe wholeheartedly in that. So we'll, we'll certainly hear from him in a moment. But let me turn to Councilmember Juwando, followed by Councilmember Navarro, followed by Councilmember Glass. Councilmember Juwando. Thank you. I uh, appreciate it, Chairman Rice. Um, you know, I think I'm glad we're not making a final decision on, on the, the number today. 
but uh, I think that consistent with what's already been said, you know, we know how uh, expensive childcare is, how disproportionately it impacts every decision. Councilman Navarro eloquently laid out a personal story of the decisions that people have to make. Um, you know, I, I would like to see uh, something, one of the things specifically I would like to see, I'm not going to move it at this point because we're just talking, but the Community Action Agency put forth an, amend, an amendment in their testimony to have uh, two of the, uh, at least two uh, of the members be low-income parents. Um, I think I'm, I'm trying to pull it up so I get it right, but uh, I, I think that's what it said, and and I just I think that's something. No matter what the composition of the public sector versus private sector is, and I'm open on that point generally. I do think uh, it makes sense to to have a good balance. Um, I think that is something that we want to make sure within whatever if it's considered private sector or non governmental members. I think at a minimum we should have a special call out for those you know low income members of who are going to be beneficiaries and folks who uh, need child care to work and to be affordable. Um, and so I just wanted to lift that up uh, as something that I'd like to put out there for the, for us to consider, because I think, I think that's in line with everything that we've been saying. Um, and it should be, I think earmarked, so to speak, there's sh those members should exist in real and in realizing that that comes with a lot of support, too, right? We're going to need to make sure that they can get to the meetings and that there's, you know, there might need to be compensation or, you know, there might, I just think all that needs to be taken, but the, the input is so critical that I think we need to find a way to do it. And um, so I just wanted to, that's one thing on this point. And then I'm open on the point of what the balance is. I'm curious to hear what the administration says, but, you know, there's value in having people who know this work from all sides, and I think everyone's saying that today, what the slight balance needs to be. Uh, you know, in an ideal world, there won't be like a block of people, you know, it's, you're not going to be worried about like the, the government block versus the private sector block, you know, everyone's going to be working together. So from in my, from my, from my opinion, I don't think it really matters if someone has slightly one more or not, but I do think it's important to really say that we're going to have this number of at least, at least two low income parents as part of the board. So. That would be my recommendation for consideration. Thank you. Excellent. And 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 just again to level set where we are, Councilmember Duano, that's exactly appropriate for what it is that we're doing. We're flushing out all of those ideas so that they'll be listed as a part of the next packet for our next meeting, so that then we can decide and vote on. So please, as folks have ideas and thoughts about how they'd like to see us proceed, let us know so that staff can then record that, and then we'll have those decision points for our next meeting to be able to then make those decisions. And again, I just didn't want us to press, you know, there needs to be thought about these kinds of things. And certainly there are pros and cons to everything. I mean, they're not allowed cons to having, you know, low income uh, providers or parents that are on the board, but certainly want to understand what that means and the implications are. And so from that standpoint, that's why I wanted to give us time. Uh, but at the same time, want to make sure that all of this is out there for us for consideration. So with that, let me turn to council member Navarro. Thank you. Um, so I, I think that this is probably one of the most important decisions in the sense that it, it defines what it is that we're doing and what fits for Montgomery County. In 2016, uh, we did bring a consultant to work with the Office of Legislative Oversight. I think they also, she presented to um, Montgomery Moving Forward as well, Naomi Scudas, and she worked on establishing the Miami-Dade Children's Trust. and. I spent a lot of time talking to her about that process. One of the things that she pointed out to me was that obviously when they uh, worked on establishing the Children's, um, the, uh, children's Trust in Miami-Dade, which I think has like $100 million by now, much more than that, um, there really was, was like not, they didn't have an early care and education infrastructure. They, they were starting from zero. And, um, and that drove the governance structure, if you will, of the composition of the board. And, you know, so we discussed a lot of different efforts around the country, Kansas City, uh, Missouri, one of my best friends from, from college, actually, who's also a council member there, launched the one there as well. Their structure is also different. And so 
it is, I think, important for us to think about Montgomery County. Montgomery, we're not starting from scratch in Montgomery County. It's very, it's, it's, it's a, a very, we've already invested quite a bit of money as well. And so I think that it is critical to figure out this balance, right? Um, because at the end of the day, the elected body is going to have to be responsible and accountable for the um, the way that the money is allocated and the how the initiative moves forward and what decisions are make are made. That is something that weighs heavily with me because I again think that it's different when you're starting from scratch versus what we're doing is taking things to the next level. And so, if the role of this entity is to literally provide you know, uh, real, you know, real time on the ground, also sort of best practices so that we can enhance what Montgomery County has done until now. But I think it is important to think about who is at the table and ultimately who is being held accountable. Uh, and so, you know, whereas in places where they were starting from scratch, they were totally independent. Um, I think in our case, having a almost 50-50 split is, is important uh, because the county council, who is the ultimate uh, uh, body that appropriates money, has to respond to stakeholders, constituents, on what it is that is happening, what are the results, what's occurring. Um, and, uh, and, and we need to figure out how we handle that. It's, it's different, I think, the, the collaboration council in, in, in many ways as well. This is very tangible. I mean, these are like very tangible sort of direct service uh, kinds of, um, of endeavors in a, in a uh, initiative that also, you know, it's going to handle federal money, state money, et cetera. So my point is, I always felt that it should be a hybrid, that the private, you know, the public sector um, needs to also have um, a presence so it can be held accountable. Uh, and if we are going to have our public sector folks, um, that we really work hard on this notion of having the representation that I mentioned earlier, and Council Member Jawanda just mentioned again, because at the end of the day, we're also trying to figure out how to provide that equity component of building the infrastructure in those places where we don't have any whatsoever. Um, so. So I'm still torn about this notion of, you know, is it more public sector than, 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 than private? Is it more private than public? I tend to believe that we should try to find a balance because, you know, it's, it's a very critical uh, initiative that I think is going to receive even more money throughout. And I know that this is not a body that is going to be controlling or, you know, appropriating dollars. I get that. But it's going to have, I think, a very important stay in the direction of this initiative. Um, so, you know, maybe it would be important to to take out again <laughs> that OLO report and all that work that was done to look at the different types of governance structures throughout the country. Um, and, um, and maybe we can use that as a guide when we come to make the final decision. But all to say that I think, you know, I, I, I lean towards having sort of a 50-50 split. And if we are going to have more public sector, more uh, private sector, that we focus on having folks who are, you know, low income from immigrant communities, et cetera, Title I schools or something like that, to provide that, those additional um, slots, because I, I, I think that is a need. Excellent. Thank you very much, Councilmember Navarro. Councilmember Glass, or Council Vice President Glass, sorry, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, so uh, I, I'll start by saying I agree with my colleagues who are saying that any new voices that be part of this board um, be the voices we want to hear from, right? Not the voices we typically hear from. Uh, and so I associate myself with, with, with them. Regarding the actual makeup of the board, uh, I'll be blunt in saying that I think 25 people is way too much. Um, I think that it is... Uh, it requires a lot more work, um, a lot more time, a lot more corralling to try and get 25 people or a, a simple majority of those people to a meeting, um, recognizing that half of them or 13 of the 25, which is 52%, 52% of them 
our county employees doing so many other things. Some of them probably serve on other boards. Um, and then, of course, the 12 others are doing other things as well. Um, and so, so this is a second, third, or fourth job for people. Um, and I think you know, best practices within the nonprofit world uh, limit board membership to you know, 10 to 18, somewhere around there. I'm sure our friends on this Zoom can say what the best practices are, but, but I think 25 is too many. So for me, starting with that, point and coming on down, um, I also think that we should reshift. Instead of having 13 ex officio and 12 who are in the private sector or philanthropic sector um, or community members, um, I think we can flip that or rebalance in a different way. And I absolutely understand that this is a public-private partnership. Um, this is, at least at this point in time, and I think for quite some time, into the future uh, will be largely supported by Montgomery County taxpayers. But the whole reason we're doing this is to be innovative. And we need to support where much of that innovation is coming from. And I do think it's from the philanthropic and private sector by the very nature of it. Um, and when we talk about checks and balances, and I absolutely uh, I, I agree with what Councilmember Navarro just said, that ultimately it is the county, it's the council, ultimately, that decides the budget. I think that while the 13 to 12 split was set up to provide those checks and balances, there is yet another check and balance, and that is in our budget. And quite frankly, I would not be shy from saying that as a member of the HHS committee, as a member of the council, if we think something is going wrong and we're hearing from members of the community that something is going wrong, we can use our budgetary authority to try and correct it. And so there is another stopgap measure beyond the actual makeup of the board. And so those are, those are my thoughts moving forward um, and happy to hear what our, our peers and friends think as well. Excellent. Um I'm going to hold some ideas I have until I've heard from all of our partners. So let me turn to Dr. Kroll, followed by uh, Ms. Friedman, and then anyone else who would like to weigh in. I'd also like to hear from Ms. Edwards on this, uh, you routing MCPS as well. Uh, Dr. Kroll. Okay, thank you, Council uh, Member Rice. I, a couple of things on this. Um, one of them is um, just a, a point of, a point of, of uh, that would raise with, with Council Member Glass. It's not the people we want to hear from, it's the people we need to hear from uh, in this process. And I think that's that's an important place. I could find people I want to hear from, but it's sometimes the voices that we need to hear from that we that, that actually end up being excluded from, from this from this process. This this more than a whole any number of boards and commissions I've sat on is in over my career is is one about inclusion and, and at a point where this is not just about um, uh, really child care, but there's, there's pre-K, there's child care, there's subsidies, there's health, mental health, Head Start programs, parent support systems, a whole raft of things that fit into this conversation that, that, that don't get discussed a lot, but are there nonetheless. Uh, the county executive proposed the addition, proposed additional representation around this, uh, for, for just that reason, but in, in particular to increase access to voice across the county. And, and really to, to, to make sure that there's a greater focus on racial equity and, and representation around this. Um, the current board as it's composed, for example, conf, uh, out, of, out of 1,200 licensed child care programs, there are only four providers on the board. Um, that group represents the vast majority of the work. Um, and most of those are small family-based providers with only two seats on the board for family providers. So it's a question of where's the voice and where's the interest and how's it going to get voiced and, and represented here, I think. Um, those, are, those are important. I also think that there is, there is on, the, on, the, on the parents side, I want to echo what Council Member Navarro said, 45,000 children served in the county, three parents or guardians proposed for representation. Um, that, is, that is a challenge. This is a big group, uh, and I think the, the, the question is, do you make it bigger, do you make it, or do you adjust the composition in some ways to, give it, to get it to the representation that it needs? You know, big groups are are are, are not uh, the most will the easiest thing to manage in the world, but they are doable, 
especially given the kind of the, the context that we're in now. We're sitting here virtually, and I can tell you that boards and commissions, the membership and attendance has jumped because people have come virtually. People are participating in ways they haven't been. So there's a, we're in a new day now in terms of our capacity to reach out to folks and, and engage folks. And I think, yes, it can be a challenge, but the, the, there is a reason that council is moving from nine to 11 people. Um, it has to do with the voice and the need to expand and make sure that the voice of, the, of, of people are represented as best they can. So, um, I mean, you aren't talking about going to five now. Just to, it would be a lot simpler with five of you, but <laughs> um, I, I think I that's not where we are. I, I hear you. <laughs> so, well, 11 uh, is not 25, I'll just say, not to interrupt. 11 yeah. is not 25. 25 in a room, trying to get 25 people in a room is a, is, is a challenge. Trying to get 25 people virtually um, I think is, is, is a challenge that we're worthy of at this point. And maybe whether that's more or it's just an adjustment, I think it's important for us to voice is the important thing in this. And, and I think that is the, that is the, um, the, the balance that we've got to seek here. Excellent. Um, I, I, thank you, Dr. Kroll. Um, I, I, I see Ms. Friedman, but I understand that Ms. Madden may be speaking on behalf of MMF. So, uh, Ms. Madden, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Um, first, we recognize how much work went into drafting the legislation and thinking critically about the membership at the outset. Um, we've done some additional thinking um, once the bill was drafted and thinking about the membership too. And I, I think we would align ourselves with many of the comments that have been made here. Um, I would think that we would wanna have goals that um, help drive this decision about the final membership of the board. Equity being uh, paramount, uh, independence having a significant weight in our minds, um, real cross-sector participation, right? A, a group that's big enough to um, make decisions, but small enough to make decisions and be able to engage with each other and have meaningful engagement across the landscape from employers to providers to parents to really drive systems building, right? Because this is what ultimately we want. We want an entity that helps make sure the system is, is effective and efficient and we actually have a system, right? And so, and then amplifying voices, right? I think we've heard that. So to me, when I think about equity, when I think about independence, when I think about real cross-sector participation, and when I think about the importance of amplifying voices, like Council Member Navarro said, just don't give a person a seat, but make sure we have folks who we can help learn how to navigate a system, how to participate at a meeting, and ensure they feel empowered to stand up to county government employees, if you will, I think that's important. And to me, all of that said, leaves us to rethinking the actual membership and the participation of government um, individuals on the board. So I think that's where MMF would um, suggest you to look there and re um, fine tuning the, the membership of the board. Sharon or Kevin or Kathy could amplify anything I've said or say anything else, but I think there's a lot of consensus here um, to get where we want to be. Could you just say more about maybe Mr. Beverly Well, like when you say rethink the, so reduce the number, just be very specific. You're saying reduce the number of public employees? Yes. Okay. Because, and then maybe Kevin, Ms. Beverly will address this too. I mean, people can be in, intimidated by a whole range of people, I mean, including, Employers, you know, including state providers and, you know, right. exactly. <laughs> so, fair enough. Both ways. Yes. Fair That's point. Both ways. Yeah. I get you. Fair point, yeah. council member. Yeah. I agree. Okay. Just by way of example, not the only folks. <laughs> I, I, thank you. I was going to raise this issue, Susan, that it is not just government <laughs> employees that can be intimidating. In fact, I've seen very little evidence of government government intimidation in the last oh, couple sorry. of years. It's okay, but I want to it, control it is, what happens between you and I behind closed doors. <laughs> 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 we'll talk. Um, I, the, the, I think that, that there is a, a need to do that. There is also a need to make sure that there are sufficient numbers of folks who, are, who have separate, who have interests that can represent and support each other in that, in that, in that space. Um, there's a lot that goes on. I forgot to say this, so forgive me, um, uh, Sharon, for jumping in. There is a lot of 
of work that goes on between council sessions and between council committee hearings to review process and the voice of people in the room are going to make decisions that council may end up in the position of having to undo or having to having to deal with the fallout from so the representation in an ongoing way is important in this process certainly I, and i again i apologize that was not my intent to to make it sound like employees are out there being mean and um to community rather it's not my point but there's only the to larger only issue. to craig right fair enough <laughs> I think there's just a larger issue again of equity and independence um, and that real cross-sector participation and amplifying voices. And if we think about those goals very deeply, where does that take us vis-a-vis -vis membership? And I'll be quiet now. Uh, Sharon or Kevin, Kevin. So, so I would just ask us as we think about this and I align a lot with what uh, council member Glass was saying around the practicality of how you get things done and how decisions get made in a, in a board meeting. Um, we are trying to, in this, uh, this setting, to reimagine early child care and education. And we are trying to apply a, a construct of how a board functions in this new order. And I think we have to take a step back and, and maybe reimagine how that structure works versus putting together what we believe are all of these different people from all these different constituencies in a way that you create this board structure. It, it, in my mind, it's kind of like putting a, a gear shift in a Tesla. It's a whole new environment. You, you've got a, an electric vehicle. You can't put a, a gear shift in there because you don't need one. So you've got to figure out, and what we have to think about is, what makes sense as a structure to a allow this new entity to really be effective? Otherwise, we burden it with all of the trappings that bureaucracies bring, and we don't allow it to actually do what we hope it's capable of doing. Thank you. Ms. Friedman. Uh, uh, Sharon, you just muted yourself. You were unmuted before. This is a, 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 a practical um, uh, uh, concern for your uh, consideration, Mr. Rice and council members. So we have heard from a number of different providers that there is some wording in the legislation. Um, it's on page five, begins at line 82, and it speaks to the fact that the executive must not appoint a member of a governing board or employee of an organization that receives county or state funds directed through the early care and education entity. And the concern is that many of the family child care providers or uh, center-based child care providers who receive public funds, whether they're federal, state, or local, would be um, not be able to, to be considered for board membership. And there are an awful lot of them that want to be considered that feel this would be a disqualifying um, uh, uh, paragraph, if you will. In looking at uh, the entire legislation, you know, we think that the ethics section could probably well cover any potential conflicts with folks having to recuse themselves or other, you know, methods of dealing with this than having this language within um, the, the framework of the legislation. So if it could be deleted, that would be the best thing. Well, thank you very much for that, Ms. Freeman. So I want to, and, and I saw a, a thumb up from Dr. Kroll. I see um, Ms. Treadvance's uh, head nodding. I'm going to turn to Bob in a second on that piece. Um, but I did want to hear from Ms. Edwards because Ms. Edwards, I did want to note uh, that as part of the board membership at this point, MCPS basically has three uh, individuals uh, that, that would be appointed representing MCPS. One is a representative de uh, designated by the County Board of Education, and then two representatives designated by the superintendent of Montgomery Public Schools. So uh, certainly because uh, you, you uh, are significant in terms of the membership there, wanted to give you an opportunity to speak as well. So Ms. Edwards. Thank you so much and good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to be here. I just wanted to, to go back and to highlight how significant this legislation will be for the children of Montgomery County. It is truly 
a um, an equity lever point that will really provide kids the opportunity to just um, one have um, limited variability in terms of the services that they will have, as well as to really provide them a huge platform to be able to enter kindergarten on the same page. In terms of the membership, there were many points that were made today, and I want to associate um, just the school system with a few of those spaces. We really want to be able to see in terms of membership on this board, one that's going to work, one that's going to work that is really going to support the needs of the children that we have been focused on in terms of this discussion, in terms of what this entity is for. Um, we, we would like to see some balance that would be there so that one, um, one space does not outweigh another, but also that there are multiple, multiple perspectives that are taken into account. And so one space I will talk about is when we consider our child care providers, there's a continuum that we know that we have. Um, child care providers that are more private and then ones that um, run that continuum of thinking about home child care. And so we really want to be able to understand um, the different programs that they offer, challenges that they may have, so that when we think about really putting this into place, making those decisions and having the conversation, we're hearing from those multiple perspectives to really be able to support the children um, throughout this process who will then support their families and then become citizens, adult citizens throughout. So, you know, for us, we definitely appreciate the opportunity to be on the board. Um, I won't use uh, Kevin's analogy about the Tesla because I will mess it up. However, um, I do agree that we've been very vanguard and really thought about this legislation. I think doing the same thing with who comes together, the conversations and the decisions and being really thoughtful and, and continuing to think about the rollout um, and who's at the table. Um, one critical point um, I do wanna bring up and we heard it often was um, as we think about voices, those voices should really, we really need to think about the people we don't hear from often um, and we don't hear from um, as succinctly um, because we are often trying to create programming, legislation, policies, or things that will benefit um, many of our families um, who are in financial need and really need this to be able to support their future and their kids. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Um, I'm looking to see, are there other comments around this issue? If not, uh, I wanna be a good chair. And so, oh, Kathy, go ahead, please. Just real quickly, sorry. Yeah, I, I think this is incredibly important. And when I think about boards running a nonprofit, this is an area where founding boards can really set the tone for the work that's done. So I just underscore the importance of being very clear with, and this is about leadership. This is about staff or management leadership and board leadership. And so making sure that leadership, whether it is the executive director and the board are really clear about the mission of the organization, the system building approach that we want it to take and the inclusivity that several people have mentioned. Because if, if that is not apparent on the founding board, um, I fear it's gonna set us in a direction that we don't intend. And so being very, very thoughtful and intentional about keeping the size of the board manageable and making sure that we are as inclusive as possible with the voices that are not at the tables and making sure that that is a place where those voices can be really listened to. Because a lot of times I find on my own board, the, we've got great strategic thinkers, but if I don't have the people on the board who are actually teaching ESOL who have boots on the ground experience, we we can't be as strategic, we can't be as effective as possible. So marrying those two is really of vital importance and you don't want one voice to drown out the other. Thanks. Right. No, no, thank you very much for that. And so I think we've had a very robust discussion around this. I did just wanna kind of put some thoughts out there. And then what I would ask of my colleagues is this, um, now that we've had a chance to hear from stakeholders, you've had a chance to hear from our your, your colleagues as well in terms of where folks stand, uh, to certainly communicate with myself, Vivian, and President Albernos uh, as the two co-chairs uh, to 
what your thoughts are in terms of what those uh, kind of uh, compositions may look like. And then we can help to flush some of those out in our next meeting as a part. Like I said, again, today, we're not going to vote on them, but I'll just put something out there for consideration and thought uh, as we approach this. And I look at this and I look at the bottom of circle three, where we start off and we have the executives, childhood education officer makes complete sense. Uh, then we also have four representatives from DHHS. Then we also have a representative of the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, then we have the Montgomery County Kerwin Coordinator. All of those positions are actually county executive positions, uh, county executive appointed positions and answer to the county executive. Uh, the county council has a council staff member with expertise in early childhood education, one uh, representative. Uh, the uh, Montgomery College, one of our key partners, has one representative. Universities at Shady Grove has one representative. Uh, and so from that standpoint, it does seem to me as though uh, the executive branch is a little bit heavy. Obviously, we'll need to have Office of Management and Budget there. We are talking about fiduciary decisions. And we need to have folks from Department of Health and Human Services. My question is whether or not we can uh, do away with uh, the four positions and maybe whittle that to two. Um, you know, uh, then when I also look at the school system, and so Ms. Edwards, obviously I'm not asking you for a decision today, but do understand that we already have one representative from the County Board of Education. Then we have two representatives designated by the superintendent of Montgomery County Public Schools. Could we not whittle that down to one, understanding that one is our elected body and one is the operational aspects of uh, MCPS, understanding that there are the two branches similar to what we deal with on the council. And so from that perspective, those are, again, just thoughts uh, that are out there in terms of where we might go. And then with those positions, to Council Member Glass's point, we could go in terms of reducing the total number, which some others have brought up, or we can utilize some of those positions to be able to enhance, as Council Member Navarro said, and keep that same number at 25 and enhance the number of opportunities for other individuals or a mishmash of the two. You know, we're talking about three or four total positions altogether. Could those, could, you know, you say two more additional community positions and then dispense of two, and now you have a board of 23 instead of 25. Just all things to think about in terms of concepts. Uh, and, 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 and just certainly want to make sure that, again, I'm not prescribing anything. I'm just throwing out there in terms of how we're thinking about this to afford that flexibility. Council Member Navarro. Yeah, I think I'm glad you brought that up because I, I, that's how I, I was uh, approaching this. I think that, you know, what, what was what was forward, what we have in front of us, I think is very prescriptive and it seems like it's not balanced at all. Um, so I, I appreciate you, you mentioning this. I think that that should be part of our exercise is to, again, try to figure out how we honor what the goal uh, and the mission and vision of of this exercise in this organization should be, and so that then that board composition should uh, absolutely be reflective of that. Um, because even though I understand the notion that, you know, if, if it's not about necessarily like intimidation, but yes, you know, you walk into a room and, and you have four executive branch, you know, representatives and you have, you know, it, it can become a bit you know, cumbersome. And, and back in the day when I was wearing my hat as, you know, nonprofit uh, executive director, you know, there were many of those types of work groups and task forces that I would walk into and it was, and that was the experience. And so we don't want to do that. You know, we want to make sure that we stay true to the ultimate uh, vision here. And, and, and I appreciate the opportunity then for all of us to then come together with perhaps some different iterations that honor, again, um, what we all say we, we want to do moving forward. So thank you for, for pointing that out. Excellent. Well, thank you very much to all of my colleagues and for all the stakeholders on this. We will, of course, obviously come back to this, but this has been an incredibly important piece of the conversation. I do agree. I think Kevin said it uh, as well, how, how this is like one of the most important uh, pieces of this. I think Councilmember Navarro said it as well. So with that, um, Bob, I'm going to turn back to you. We have a couple others. I know that, uh, Council President, you do have a hard stop at four. 
I think that the remainder of these are a little bit easier. This is where we wanted to spend most of our time because we knew that this was really important. The other pieces of this, I think, are pretty much straightforward. So with that, turn it over to you, Mr. Drummer, number five. Did you want me to address the request from MMF on lines 81 through 84? Oh, oh, yes, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, 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 thank you. Just, I mean, that's a pretty standard ethics question. Uh, you not only couldn't participate in any matter that involved the board you're working on, but if it's grants to other organizations that you're competing with, you'd have the same problem. Right. So I think it's an attempt to avoid that uh, that situation from from rearing its ugly head where people would be um, would have yeah, a conflict. You know, a conflict yeah. means you've got two, you know, two bosses, you know, you've got conflicting interests and you don't know what to do. And and it's not that you're a bad person, but you you're in a situation, you're in a no win situation. So it's a pretty standard uh, provision. Yeah, I would just say that, uh, and I'll speak personally on this, it's one of the reasons why I am not on a number of boards. Uh, I've, I've always told uh, folks, and it was my former chief of staff who would always uh, lay this out, that, that I do more of a disservice than a service uh, by being on your board, because then I'm precluded from voting on, you know, confirming anything when it comes to grants, any of those kinds of things. I know Kathy's nodding her head. She's heard it from me and from others as I've been invited to serve on boards, but I serve on some and they just know that I just won't be able to serve in that capacity when it comes to advocating for funding. Um, I do believe that allowing for the flexibility of people to make that decision uh, and understanding that it may be something that, you know, may end up not being in their favor for, for, from that standpoint. Um, but, you know, uh, allowing the flexibility and not precluding anyone from participating, uh, I, I think is a little bit easier and letting people make their, their own individual decisions about whether or not uh, they want to have that impact. Uh, that's something that we are afforded as council members. And I feel as though maybe uh, something we want to afford individuals, but, you know, I'm, I'm not, said on this, but uh, I see Council Vice President Glass has his hand up. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, so I think this conversation is a natural one to have after the one we just had, right? So with regard to the 25 board members as, as proposed um, and regarding any potential conflicts of interest now for any of those potential 25 members, um, which I'll just reiterate, I don't think, I think 25 is too many, uh, but I think that what this uh, instructs us is to create, is to allow the organization to create a secondary tier, um, an advisory board or certain committees whereby anybody who has a potential conflict of interest, and I agree and appreciate everything that, that the chair just said, that they would not put themselves or this body in that predicament, and they would serve in an advisory capacity. So they don't have those full voting rights, but they make their opinions heard. And I think that would be a good vehicle for reducing the 25 board members to something more manageable and have those people um, assigned to any of these working groups or, or committees. So. I throw that out there. Excellent. Um, so, so I'm going to call on Susan, but I, I know that we actually have a hard stop for Councilmember Navarro uh, as, as 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 well. And again, we're going to come back to this. So we're not making a decision today, but just wanted to flush out some of those. So, Susan, go ahead. S Susan, you're on mute. You're on mute. I would just add quickly that the entity will do more than make these grant decisions, if you will, right? The larger scope of the work is to build the system and move us forward, right? Which all members should be able to participate in free from that conflict of interest, right? And that this is a narrow list of tasks for which an individual can conflict themselves out and accuse themselves during the course of their business. And so I wouldn't want to preclude a provider 
um, from participation because of that. And I think there are solutions, as you said. Okay, excellent. So, so I think we have, have heard both both sides of the issue. Again, we're not going to decide this today, colleagues, but we will certainly come back to this and we'll highlight that in the packet, both the pros and cons of each of those. Uh, Bob, let's go on to number five. And number five was something suggested by the executive uh, to require a transparent RFP process to select the nonprofit corporation to serve as the entity. Uh, that sounds good in theory, but if you think about what you created, you could put on an RFP and you'll get no responsive requests because there's nobody out there that has 25 board members, 13 of them, you know, all appointed by the executive, confirmed by the council, representing all these organizations. Uh, I don't think it's workable. Um, you know, you could do that if you change, if you reduce the requirements and just say you, you're looking for a nonprofit corporation that has the ability to do this, this, and this, and not dictate who the board members are and not, not say we're going to appoint them and not, then, then I would definitely recommend you do an RFP. Uh, but the way you've got it set up, I just don't think it's workable. Yeah, I would, I would personally agree. And I'm, and, and I'm just going to look to my colleagues if anybody has any concerns that uh, doesn't agree with the position that Bob's just taken. All right, and seeing none, we can move on. Again, we're not going to make a decision today, but this, that'll be highlighted as a decision point in the packet as well. Let's go ahead to racial equity and social justice, because I know that Councilman Navarro has to leave soon. So go ahead, Bob. Okay. Uh, well, the OLO report, you know, makes it clear that there are racial and social inequities in early care and education. I think that's probably a given. Um, and, you know, the goal of the organization would hopefully reduce those uh, inequities and that would promote racial equity. Uh, what they couldn't jump to is, again, like, the economic development, the economic impact statement is, is this experiment going to produce uh, a reduction in, in those inequities? I know that's the goal and that's the hope, but you can't say for sure that that's going to work. Um, so that's, that's the report, basically. You know, this is an area we need to work on. This is an attempt to work on it. Unless you know it's going to work, you can't really say that, what how this is going to affect racial and social inequities in early care and education. Yeah, and I think that that's that's one of the reasons why, with our discussion around the structure of how we want to set this up, we're really being intentional about addressing those particular issues. I see Councilmember Navarro nodding her head, so, so so that is the key. So even beyond where we have the bill currently drafted, the things that we're looking to do and amending it and changing it to really focus on this will make it even stronger and hopefully make it even more uh, so that we're set up for success when it comes to alleviating some of the racial and social inequities that we see in the space of early care and education. So um, I, I, I think we're all in agreement there and understand that there are no guarantees, but uh, we are certainly doing our best and putting our best foot forward. Dr. Coral, did you want to say something quickly on this one? Yeah, just briefly and just very quickly on this, just just the, the importance of transparency in this process at this point. Um, we are coming out of two years of really challenging times, and there's been a lot of conversation. Um, you participated in some of those conversations just recently about transparency in, 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 in our processes. Um, there is no organization at this point that can exist without the help of the executive and the council at this point. And so th that would have, to, to Mr. Trummer's point, I think, uh, is, is important. Um, it, it doesn't, and, and when we talk about racial equity and social justice, I think that transparency becomes even more important at this point. So um, it's, uh, the, the bill also doesn't, just for the record, uh, um, ascribe, describe a method for appointing an executive director for the entity. And that is, again, another place where there should be some transparency and uh, a recommendation from, from, from uh, our side of the table is that this would be a competitive process as well. So, so you're teeing up uh, one of our next conversations. And so I saw nodding heads there as well. So I think that, again, when we're talking about the executive director, as well as our three co-chair system, uh, so when we talk about leadership uh, of this entity moving forward, that is going to be another discussion point. So let's jump into that very quickly. I know that some of us may have to drop off. Again, we are not making decisions today, but certainly wanted to go ahead and dive into our next topic. 
uh, which is about the three co-chair system, and we can throw in uh, the executive director piece on that as well. So, Bob? Okay, you've got an unusual, potentially awkward situation where you're requiring the board to set up three co-chairs. Um, maybe that's been done elsewhere. I haven't seen it. Uh, you can, uh, well, but you, you know, if, if you're going to do that, um, first of all, if, if the, when you set up a board and they're, you know, you probably, you're appointing people to the board, you're appointing them because you believe that they're going to do what you want them to do. And you may want to just let them figure out how they're going to have a chair and how they're going to appoint a chair rather than try and dictate it in legislation. Um, but if you're going to require three chairs um, from, you know, one from public sector, one from the private sector and one parent or guardian, uh, someone's going to have to decide well, what's the different roles, who's chairing the meeting, how do you do this? And what, you know, it seems like, you're creating a potential awkward situation that doesn't necessarily need to be in the legislation at all. Um, that's, you know, you're, I think you're starting to go a little overboard on what you're expecting and how you're expecting this nonprofit, technically independent corporation to work. Yeah. Uh, you're telling them how to do everything and, uh, and you're not letting them do, you're not letting them figure it out for themselves. I mean, if they ultimately decide they need three chairs, so be it. But do you really want to put that in the legislation? Um, if they decide there's going to be three chairs, they'll also have to decide how they're going to allocate the responsibilities of the chair. And uh, Okay. All that's, right. that's Let's, my yep, yep. No, thank you, Bob. And I certainly understand, I will just say, coming off of, uh, being one of the co-chairs of the NACO Broadband Task Force, and I know it's task force, it's not the same thing, but um, it, it, it worked, and, and, you know, so so I've experienced it in terms of being a co-chair, um, and it just naturally gravitated into how it worked, but um, I'm, I'm going to let other folks go first. Uh, Council Member, uh, or uh, Council President Albernos, followed by Council Member Navarro, because I know she has to jump off. Uh, Council President Albernos. I'll yield to Councilmember Navarro if she has to jump off. I, I'm good until four. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I guess um, I am not wedded to, to, to that structure. I can see how it can be totally burdensome and awkward. Um, I also, I guess the other piece of that was this notion of, um, I guess, you know, the board, I assume, would have to go through a process to hire the executive director. So, um, so, so that was my only piece. I, I, that's the thought. I thought that's where we were going. But, um, I mean, the issue of three co-chairs, um, yeah, I don't know. That that seems like might be a bit difficult to, to navigate. So, that's my only thought on that. And I'm open to to hear some other structures because it, it 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 just seems awkward to me as well. Chair, sure. okay, thank you very much, Chair Albernos. Yeah, Bob brings up a good point. Uh, it may not be necessary for us to prescribe, but maybe recommend. Um, but I think, and I don't know how we parse that language um, so that it's not codified, but we acknowledge that we would like the leadership. I think the intent is clear. We want the leadership to reflect uh, the three sectors, if you will, um, you know, public, private, and community, specifically apparent, uh, to, to elevate those voices to a leadership role. I, like you, uh, Chairman Rice, I have, you know, you've been around long enough. Uh, I, I was uh, the co-chair along with uh, Uma Oluwalia and Chief Manger for the Positive Youth Development Initiative. We had the prevention, intervention, and suppression kind of covered there, and it did work. Uh, we alternated uh, who was responsible for chairing respective meetings and who was responsible for <laughs> writing the minutes and coordinating those particular meetings, um, but I, I do think there's some merit to allowing the board itself and again, giving them a long enough runway to be able to make these decisions themselves. Um, but recommending that there be high level positions given and 
uh, decision-making authority to those three sectors that we were trying to identify as the intent of the bill. Ms. Friedman. Oh, I'm good. Okay. Uh, Council Member Glass, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Council Member. Uh, uh, Council Vice President, I missed you. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so, um, a few different thoughts here. One, uh, I, I do think that having a triumphant is a bit too much. Um, you know, one of the possible ways to go about that, um, to mitigate that, is by mandating alternating years or alternating terms that it go public sector, private sector. Some organizations do that. Um, or, uh, as Councilmember Navarro knows, possibly go to a COG model where you have three jurisdictions serving in leadership, one president and then two other vice presidents or something like that, um, so that they're all part of that table. Um, but then I just wanna add one other, I think, complexity to this, that we, we've spent a lot of time talking about voices that we want and need to be there and possible, um, I think the word was used, intimidation, uh, right? And now we're expecting them to step into leadership as well. So it's just another complicating factor to, to think about, but I think uh, the COG model might be the best if everybody wants three people. Otherwise, I would offer having alternating alternating chairs based on their, whatever, whatever their terms might be. So, colleagues, let me just offer that one of the things is, as, as we heard from Mr. Drummer, we can be silent on this and let the board ultimately make that decision, right? So that is an option for us. We don't have to prescribe it. And so the question is for MMF, for Dr. Kroll, and I'll let Dr. Kroll go first because I haven't heard uh, from DHHS uh, yet who would likely be uh, one of the leads when it comes to the public sector, them or of course MCPS or Montgomery College or uh, USG. But um, certainly from that standpoint, um, what are your thoughts regarding whether or not we need to be prescriptive or whether or not we can be silent and let the board ultimately decide. Dr. Crow. So I have a couple of different observations about it, and I'm, I, I confess to being um, to a little bit on the fence on this one. Um, but I think that, that one of the suggestions of, of a chair and two vice chairs is something that we've made at, at various points along the way when we were looking at various iterations of this that would give us some, um, some, some diversity in that. The other one is uh, you're familiar with the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council uh, that has a president, a chair and a vice chair that alternate between a government um, uh, representative and a civilian representative, a non-government representative. So there's some options around that. I think that the, that, that the bigger challenge for us is if the council doesn't wish to specify to set that out, that the requirement then is somehow that the executive leadership of that structure have diversity, diverse representation from the sectors that, are, that they need to be represented so that there is, no matter what those functions are, there are there is representation because that's where a lot of the ongoing work happens in between board meetings and so that voice gets to be crucial so just an observation about a, another option proposed to consider other thoughts around that you guys can just jump in you can go ahead and unmute yourselves if you have some thoughts okay um hearing none I think that it seems as though there are two different approaches, and I want to just try and instruct staff in terms of what the best strategy for us moving forward is. And so I think that one involves the rotation model uh, that Councilmember Glass kind of highlighted, uh, that Council uh, that, that uh, Director Kroll uh, talked about as well, which is the chair, vice chair, two vice chairs, whatever it is you want to call it, kind of model where they rotate. Uh, the other one is to be silent on the issue and allow for, um, but with some language, like we heard from Dr. Kroll saying that we recommend, right? So having it codified, as uh, we heard from Council President Albernos, the intent of what it is that we'd like to see, meaning that, you know, there will be an, an uh, alternating role in which who is going to take leadership. So either of those are options for us. Uh, of course, the other, the third option is to just remain silent. So there are three different ones, I think, that are before us. One that's the model of uh, of, of delineating a rotation. The other is of uh, codifying language, recommending a rotation. And the other is to stay silent on the issue and let the board come up with it themselves. So I think that those are the three options that are before us for staff that we can uh, discuss. And it seems as though most people are kind of on the fence on this one and kind of you know, uh, but, but I haven't heard anybody who says they insist that it has to be three altogether. So at least we're dispensing of that 
Uh, and so we've gotten to a place to where we have those three different options. Okay. All right. Mr. Drummer, I do believe that that brings us to the end of the packet. It does. Uh, and so what I wanted to do before I go to Dr. Kroll, uh, I promised that I would allow uh, for MMF and uh, when it comes to Mr. Beverly to just have some remarks about what it is. Now that we've gotten through this packet uh, and we see uh, the light at the end of the tunnel in terms of uh, what this entity may look like, I want to give an opportunity to folks to just reflect uh, upon this journey that's been a multi-year approach to how we're addressing early care and education in the county. Mr. Beverly. Thank you, sir. Um, I, this has been uh, the first time I've participated in something like this, and it's uh, it's an amazing process. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of hard work that's gotten us to this point. I, I first want to just thank all of you for the incredible work that you guys have done to put together this activity, you know, to put this coordinating center legislation into practice. I mean, you've got MMF, you've got nonprofit Montgomery, you've got hundreds and hundreds of active community participants who are out there behind you and are grateful for your leadership. And I know Ms. Navarro has had to leave, but you know, she's the original ECE champion, and we really do appreciate her life's work around this work. Um, and you, Mr. Rice and Mr. Albanez, have been great stewards, incredible perseverance. I'm sure you're getting you're getting information from all sources, and you're, we do appreciate all that you are trying to work through as you shepherd this through this process, because it's it is an amazing process. Now we we've, we've talked earlier. We can't stress enough during these trying times of just how important this is. It's new, it's innovative, it's our opportunity to truly rearrange the deck chairs uh, and build a whole new boat around them. So I, I really do believe that the work that currently exists has done a great job. Uh, they, our folks at HHS and MCPS, the Collaboration Council, the ECCC, have all been in this work, all with incredible intentions of making sure our children get the best. But we're at a different point in time. We're not trying to, to work to get back to where we were. We really do want to move this forward in a different direction. I mean, I'll, I'll go back to my analogy. We just built this Tesla. We, don't, we want to make sure that we give it every opportunity to be the next generation of vehicle that we all, all have here. And you know, Sharon's comments earlier about the, the feedback that we've gotten from the philanthropic community and their interest in this and how the business community has come to the table, both philanthropically and with their leadership and their understanding. And for us to have them at the table early in this process, open their eyes in ways that they hadn't been opened before. So I just want to say again, thank you. You all have done an incredible job of getting us to this point, And I look forward to our next steps. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Reverly, and I'm going to give all my colleagues an opportunity to give some closing remarks as well if they'd like to. Uh, but I did want to turn to Dr. Kroll, who had uh, another uh, 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 amendment that, that he wanted us to consider as well as a part of the overarching uh, bill. So, Dr. Kroll. Thank you, Councilwoman. I want to just start by saying that this is not something new and it's not a late minute, last minute uh, change. It does not affect the entity and the conversation we've had up to this point in any way. It is a request. Uh, in the original uh, legislation that enabled the ECCC, there was a child care and early education policy officer that was that was identified in statute. Um, the, this, what you're working on now, eliminates the need for that. We have need for the position elsewhere in the system and would request an amendment that allows, that eliminates that from from the requirement, so that we can feel, so that we can move on with 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 building other parts of the system as we need to. Absolutely, and we can do specific, and we can provide you with some specific language around that if, if that helps. That would be terrific, and 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 I don't think that my colleagues would have any objection to that in terms of allowing flexibility for HHS to make sure that uh, its complement and cadre of employees matches with what their responsibilities are. So, uh, from that perspective, I don't think that'll be a challenge. Thank you, um, sir. Let me just say, well, well, let me turn to my colleagues. Uh, uh, Mr. Co-Chair, do you have any closing remarks, any things that you wanted to? 
This has been great. Uh, there's obviously, uh, we'll, we'll finalize this in the next session, but uh, I think we did most of the heavy lifting today. And so I'm looking forward to the next session and I thank everybody for your participation. Council Vice President Glass. Uh, ditto, we, we got through a lot and we know what we have to work through before we have our next conversation. So thank you. Council Member Jawando. Yeah, just want to thank everybody. We're, we're way far ahead of, as often the case in Montgomery County, we're ahead of a lot of folks uh, as far as the work that's been done before. We're trying to chart a new path and to expand uh, to make sure we support every child, every family, uh, put us on a path. And I know that's all our shared goal and vision, and we're going to get there. So uh, great session today and look forward to uh, continuing the work. Appreciate it. Here, here. And, uh Thank you, Council Member Joando. You, you you don't know, but you teed it up perfectly because I think that again, uh, my colleagues uh, graciously appointed me as the National Association of Counties representative, along with Council Vice President Glass, uh, and I've certainly taken the reins when it comes to uh, education policy. I'm the chair of the Human Services and Education uh, uh, Committee, and so there, uh, I am looking to share. Uh, and I've mentioned this to my colleagues all across the country. Uh, and what you heard in terms of our leadership and the potential that we have uh, to really help other uh, folks across this country do what we're doing here is what each and every one of us cares about, right? We care about it for our own community, but we know the benefits are societal benefits. Uh, when it comes to addressing the myriad of challenges that you heard Council Member Navarro espouse, when it comes to just you know, look, the, the, the realism of it is that the responsibility of childcare often falls on the mother. Uh, and so when it comes to women being able to enter the workforce and having the ability uh, to be able to uh, take on jobs that encompass more responsibility and all those are oftentimes dictated by their ability to access affordable and high quality childcare. Uh, that is a significant issue. And so we're addressing societal challenges uh, by doing this. And this is something that we need to share uh, with many folks across this country so that they can also benefit from some of the great things that we're doing here. So I just want to make sure that folks understand that this is far beyond just what we're doing for Montgomery County. This is something that certainly can serve as a model for what people across this country can do to address some of those issues, and especially coming out of COVID, where we know that people are looking to retool. We, call, we talk about the great resignation, and folks are looking to rebirth and reinvent uh, their um, economic opportunities. This is a great time. This is a great time to do exactly what we're doing now. And so from that perspective, I just want to thank every single one of you uh, for continuing the fight, uh, continuing to, you know, have your shoulder to the grindstone to make sure that we continue to push this forward. I want to thank folks for being flexible and understanding that as we heard earlier that, you know, the ways in which we've been able to do things, which were still great and we still were a leader then, um, aren't enough now. We've got to do more. And so from that standpoint, understanding that, and I really look at people like Joanne Barnes who continue to lead us when it came to children, youth and family services, and continue to keep Montgomery County on the forefront. And I feel as though this legislation will enable us to continue the great things that we've done under her leadership and now under the leadership of Ms. Treadman. So, you know, this is this is not, you know, I don't I don't see this as a changing from what it is that we've done. I see it as a building upon the great foundation that we've had and being able to embark on even higher uh, achievements for us as a community. And so for that. I say thank you to each and every one of you for your commitment to our kids, to our families, for our community as a whole. And so with that, ladies and gentlemen, we're adjourned. Take care and stay safe, everybody. From August 30th, 2021 through early June, 2022.